those of us who don't know this artist, can you begin with a, just telling us who Eastman Johnson is, what his training was, his background, and how it was that he came to be here? Johnson was born in Maine and uh, uh, self-trained as an artist uh, in the beginning. He uh, was born in 1824 and by the time he was a teenager he was making portraits of his family and people in his, uh, in his town. When he was a young man he went to Washington and set himself up as a portrait artist and began doing charcoal portraits. At a time when photography was still very rare and kind of in its infancy, uh, it, charcoal portraits were the way that uh, people captured the, the likeness of themselves and people they loved and famous people as well like statesmen. Uh, Johnson uh, uh, had some success right from the beginning. Um, aside from uh, family and friends, some of the uh, circle of intellectuals around Concord and Boston uh, in Massachusetts were among his early patrons. People like Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, who was beginning work on uh, his what would become his, his epic poem, The Song of Hiawatha. And uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson was another early patron. So Johnson's portraits done when he was in his 20s show, uh, show these uh, uh, kind of the Concord uh, circle uh, at the height of their fame and power. And then after uh, uh, formalizing his artistic training in Europe, um, artists of, of his era would go, often go to Germany. Americans would go to Germany to study in the traditional academies. Uh, he chose to go to Dusseldorf, a city that had a very strong tradition of realist drawing and painting. And there he uh, joined a circle of American artists who were already there. One of them was a man named Emanuel Leutze, who did that famous painting of Washington crossing the Delaware, the painting of Washington standing in his rowboat as he uh, crosses over during the Revolutionary War. And uh, Johnson sh shared a studio with Leutze there and uh, helped him paint some of the figures in Washington crossing the Delaware. Um, so he was, you know, from the beginning, he was really a part of the kind of the network of major American artists of his time. And then uh, when he completed his training, came back to the U.S., continued to make some portraits. And then I think uh, by then he was in his early 30s, and I think uh, probably still kind of footloose. Johnson actually came to Lake Superior twice in the 1850s. The first time he came in 1856, and uh, he was coming to visit his sister and uh, her husband, the Newtons, and uh, also did uh, portraits of, of them while he was here. Uh, on his second visit, uh, he came for a longer time. He built a cabin on Pokegama Bay. Can you tell us a little bit about the sketches of the cabin itself? Well, we have two sketches, uh, one of which shows a man uh, taken to be a self-portrait of Eastman Johnson. And uh, uh, it uh, shows uh, really what I, strikes me as a, as a pretty cozy looking place. He's uh, seated before a big uh, uh, rough stone fireplace and uh, sitting on some kind of homemade rustic furniture. Uh, that's a uh, sketch that has been with the collection uh, and has been on view in the depot for, for many years. Then the second uh, cabin sketch is one that, uh, that was discovered uh, in 1996 and has uh, fortunately been added to the collection here at the depot. And uh, that shows what, uh, it shows the interior of a cabin and uh, uh, again, a kind of a, uh, a rustic cabin interior with, uh, with lots of uh, rough cut whittled furniture and uh, would look like some uh, uh, flaps of cloth, perhaps canvas to cover over a window or to cut down on the drafts. And, uh, and again, uh, uh, pretty rough homemade work, but a, a cozy looking setting for an artist on the frontier. Tell us a little bit more about this region during that particular time in history, what he would have seen when he came here. Well, I, th I think he would have, uh, would have found a well-established town in Superior and uh, also would have uh, gotten some sense that this was a place that was about to boom, about to take off. Uh, part of the reason being that the Treaty of La Pointe had been signed in 1854 on Madeline Island, uh, which, which made some lands in what's now Minnesota, uh, the state of Minnesota, um, available to settlement and to speculation. Um, Johnson himself gave us one of the best, uh, best visuals for what he found when he was here because he did a beautiful charcoal drawing of, uh, of kind of the sweep of the bay, a steamboat in the, uh, in the foreground and uh, the town of Superior on the far shore. So we know it was a well settled town, uh, well built up and that uh, it had some regular, uh, regular traffic of steamboats and other, other kinds of uh, lake trade. Do you know why it was that Eastman Johnson started to focus his attention on Grand Portage? 
and on specifically the Ojibwe there? It was something that was kind of, kind of in the air, kind of in the wind, uh, a realization that this was a time when the Western landscape was changing very quickly, uh, that uh, these treaties would lead to the settlement of lands that had been Indian lands for, uh, for hundreds of years. Uh, popular thinking at the time was that Indian people would be, would be uh, vanishing from the earth, uh, an assumption that uh, white settlement and the farming of lands and the logging of lands would push Indian people further and further west and, uh, and that they would, uh, would just disappear, which uh, as, you know, as we know is uh, not come to pass by any means. Uh, but uh, there's a feeling that kind of, a, kind of an anthropological impulse behind uh, the work of a lot of artists, and that was probably in the mind of Eastman Johnson as well, that this was an opportunity to record some people before their life way would be really drastically changed. Uh, there are uh, stories that uh, he met uh, people like uh, members of the Banga family who had been active in the fur trade for generations before that. And on that second trip, he went to Grand Portage uh, uh, and uh, spent several months there and he made uh, the several dozen uh, portrait uh, drawings and sketches that are part of the collection today. What can you tell us about the paintings and drawings that he did at Grand Portage? I like the way Johnson's fit a lot of information and a lot of details about the people that he met at Grand Portage into one really tiny little picture, it's just three or four inches tall and just a foot wide. But uh, he gives a real sense of the scale of the landscape that uh, otherwise we don't get any sense of from his drawings. But here, if you can see the, uh, uh, the mountain in the background really kind of sets, uh, sets the scene uh, and uh, a whole series of, uh, of bark lodges, cabins, wigwams all together in the foreground. Another aspect of it that this camp scene suggests is the way Grand Portage was a place where different cultures met. Uh, not one to supplant the other or one to take the place of another, but live side by side and kind of um, took what worked and what they liked about each other's cultures. That's implied, I think, architecturally by the fact that uh, the, the log cabins and the, uh, and the wigwams are, are both in use here. Uh, many years after the, uh, uh, the early fur trade contact is, uh, has long, long been history. Uh, also, the sense that there's a whole lot of people here. Uh, I think there'd be a lot of assumption on the part of people back east in the 1850s and probably still today that, uh, that it's uh, probably a fairly sparse, uh, uh, fairly bleak landscape. But instead we get this picture almost like a, like a Bruegel picture from, uh, uh, from the Renaissance in Europe of lots and lots of people working together in the landscape and kind of making a place for their own community at the foot of the mountain. Johnson titled his drawing of a, of a mother and child, Kabe Sendid Wei Win. And uh, I think it's one of the instances in which uh, he gave a very specific portrayal of people and uh, also included their own name in their own language. A uh, uh, small thing perhaps, but uh, something that relatively few artists did to take the care to identify them, to use their own, uh, their own language and name for themselves. And I think that uh, the words kind of fit with that sense of, uh, of of respect that he seemed to have for the people he was drawing. I feel real strongly when I look at the charcoal drawings in particular that uh, uh, he was doing his best to, uh, to record in a real sympathetic way the individual that he met, uh, not, to be, uh, not to be blinded or, or uh, to be influenced by some sense that these were uh, poor downtrodden people or people whose uh, time on the landscape was passing as many of his contemporaries preferred to think of Indians, but rather he was, he was, thinking, he was looking face to face and trying to uh, uh, capture that person uh, at their best. I think there's, in a sense, a lesson to it uh, that uh, uh, gives us an opportunity to, to kind of come face to face with Ojibwe people who were living here 150 years ago. Uh, I think we often think of, of the past, uh, you know, we think of kind of groups of people or types of people, uh, but uh, when we see an actual portrait with a name attached, the name, you know, their own name as they call themselves, uh, another aspect of, of some of the drawings of the people at Grand Portage is that they're titled in Ojibwe. Um, so uh, uh, rather than being as, uh, as I think a lot of, uh, a lot of museum visitors from the mainstream audience will think of Indian pictures, quote unquote. 
But I think uh, we come into a collection like this and we stop and we look at these really beautifully dignified portrayals of people and we start thinking about, hey, you know, these were real people here. They're not people from the past. They're not Indians compared to whites. Uh, these are real people. This is an opportunity to kind of remind us that uh, this was uh, a community of, of people. We see their families together, uh, those generations, uh, mothers and children and, uh, and elders together with younger people. So it's, uh, it's kind of an invitation to think of Grand Portage 150 years ago as a community of individuals and families, something which uh, I think sometimes gets a little bit either romanticized or just left out of our thought when we think about uh, people in the past. What are some of Johnson's themes? I kind of uh, look at this uh, collection as something where he was not just uh, recording people in a particular place, but an early example of something that he would do later in his career in different places with different kinds of people. And that's to look at people who are of a culture different from his own and uh, to portray them with uh, a lot of dignity, to really you know, look, them, look them in the, in the eyes and uh, make, make very detailed, very uh, dignified portrayals of them rather than just romanticize or stereotype them. Another aspect of, of his work here that I think uh, is uh, almost, uh, almost a harbinger of what he would do later on is to, uh, to look at groups of family members at Grand Portage, uh, the mother and child theme, but not to treat it as a stereotype like the old European mother and child theme, the old religious theme, but rather to look at a couple of individuals, you know, how an Ojibwe mother just kind of cradled uh, a young sleeping child against her. Um, and that's a theme that he would then, then use later on back in New York City when he was uh, one of the nation's best known portrait artists and he would do very, very affectionate portrayals of, uh, of women kind of the, in the height of Victorian uh, parlor interiors, uh, all dressed up in lace and brocade and they'd be playing with their babies or holding their babies. So, you know, as I look, as I look at slides of his work over a 40 year span, I realize that he would look to these themes. Um, one of the themes that uh, Johnson painted at Grand Portage that uh, I see reappearing later in his career also involved uh, whole families, several generations working together or playing together. Uh, the, the, the little landscapes uh, in oils that he did at Grand Portage where we see a silhouette of the hills in the background and we see uh, bark lodges and log cabins and then a whole crowd of people in the foreground uh, have a, just an amazing similarity to some landscapes that he did a few years later on Nantucket Island. Uh, after the Civil War, he bought some land there and spent every summer there for the rest of his life. And uh, he returned again and again, uh, not just to summer there, but also to paint the people he met on Nantucket Island. And he was interested in the way these families worked together on the, uh, the cranberry harvest. A uh, beautiful outdoor subject like that, but also uh, he had little kids running around the feet of, uh, of their parents and their brothers and sisters, uh, older people, uh, the, the grandparents uh, involved in the harvest as well, all working together there. Uh, it's a theme that shows up in some of his Grand Portage pictures and then is picked up again in the outdoor setting at Nantucket or in a kind of portrait that he was very famous for at the end of his life where he'd portray an entire family together, uh, children, parents, grand, uh, grandparents all together uh, in their home or in their yard, in their garden, uh, something that critics called his environmental portraits, where he'd get a sense of the place people lived as well as their, the interrelations among different generations uh, together in that place. Something that we see, uh, uh, I sense kind of a beginning in, of that uh, trend in his grand, portrait, uh, grand Portage paintings, which he then uh, brings to, to other settings, some of them very familiar to him, uh, like, like those New York uh, parlor scenes, uh, kind of his own, his own class and, uh, and his, own, uh, uh, his own group uh, within society, but also uh, to, to other cultures as well. About how many paintings and drawings did Eastman Johnson produce during this time, do you estimate? Well, we know that, uh, the, of course, the collection here at, uh, at the depot has about three dozen pictures in it, uh, about a dozen oil paintings and uh, many charcoal drawings and, uh, and a pastel. Hmm. Does that seem like an awful lot for, um, was he a, an unusually prolific painter, sketcher, drawer at this point? Well, I'd uh, certainly see he had a he had a good work ethic in his uh, in his art. Uh, 
Um, and uh, you know, if we think in terms of a 19th century artist's work, uh, it would be expected that you'd do lots of drawings of a subject that interested you or, or a subject for which you had a commission or a plan to do a painting. So uh, an artist would commonly do as many as, uh, as a few sketches to a few dozen sketches uh, in pencil or charcoal and then some sketches in oil and these would all uh, help him uh, kind of refine his composition or his sense of the the visual picture the visual story he wanted to tell before making a, a generally a larger size uh, canvas back in the studio there's an address in the St. Louis County Historical Society collection uh, that uh, is one example of uh, Johnson's practice of bringing home some of the objects that belonged to the people that he'd portrayed at Grand Portage, something that he could use in his studio for, uh, for ready reference years later. So the works that we have in the, uh, in the Eastman Johnson collection here are things that uh, very likely were a kind of a note-taking, a kind of a visual note-taking which he might have uh, drawn on later in his career had, uh, had time, uh, time permitted. And um, then he did meet with success as a portrait painter? He did, uh, fairly, uh, fairly soon after that. Uh, one, of the, one of the ways an American artist would, uh, uh, would try to gain some, some recognition and some economic success in the mid-19th century was by submitting works to exhibits that were held by uh, art associations in various cities or by institutions like the National Academy of Design in New York City, one of the, one of the nation's uh, foremost and oldest art organizations. And uh, after going back east, uh, Johnson did uh, uh, enter his, his works in those competitions and get some, uh, uh, some recognition there. Uh, he was well connected. His uh, family, uh, his father was in politics in, uh, back in Maine, and uh, that helped him get an entree uh, both in New England and in Washington, D.C. To, uh, to sitters who would pay for portraits and introduce him to other sitters. Uh, so that also helped spread his, uh, spread his reputation around. So all those things, I think, uh, contributed toward his uh, making a name for himself and then eventually being, uh, being elected by kind of the, uh, the company of his peers being elected to the National Academy. What was the reaction to the Grand Portage paintings and drawings during his lifetime? Well, it's kind of a curious uh, fact of their history is that there doesn't seem to have been any reaction. Uh, basically because he doesn't seem to have shown them. The first public showing of the collection that we're aware of was a couple of years after Johnson's death. Uh, his widow uh, placed the collection on exhibit in New York City at the American Museum of Natural History as part of their ethnographic or anthropological displays. And uh, that was, uh, as far as we know, the first time it had a public viewing. Uh, we know that Johnson not only kept the collection, but uh, probably it, it had some, uh, some important place in his own sense of his, of his own artistic career because paintings from the, uh, the Grand Portage collection show up in photographs of Johnson's studio at the end of his life. How did this collection come to be here in the depot and with the St. Louis County Historical Society? A businessman from Chicago named Richard Teller Crane had uh, a branch of his firm in Duluth, and uh, some newspaper accounts describe it as the pet of the firm. So apparently he was very fond of the city and of the branch of his business here. Crane was in New York and uh, saw the Eastman Johnson collection on view at the American Museum of Natural History, and uh, realizing the connection to Lake Superior and to the whole region, uh, decided he would purchase the collection from Eastman Johnson's widow and uh, have it shipped to Duluth as uh, kind of his gift to the city. So uh, it was shown uh, in a number of places uh, in Duluth over the years before finally coming to the St. Louis County Historical Society, which has been its, uh, its steward for uh, several uh, decades now. In summing this all up and coming to a, a conclusion for this interview, is there a lasting legacy? Is there a final word from you about this, um, this um, display in Eastman Johnson as an artist? I think the, uh, uh, the legacy or the, uh, the place of, of the Johnson collection in, uh, uh, in Duluth and, and more generally uh, in the Lake Superior area in the upper Midwest is, uh, is that this is a really beautifully rendered uh, uh, portrayal uh, 
of a community at a, at a very specific moment and uh, we can relate it uh, back toward the fur trade era and think about uh, the reason Grand Portage was there and was, uh, was still, a, uh, was still a, a community in the 1850s. And then I think more importantly we can uh, try to um, bring it into a continuity toward the present day. Today we're, we have the opportunity to look at the collection, we have the opportunity to, to even think about what it would look like to be on the other side of the sketchbook in a sense because we have artists like Morrison and uh, like, like uh, Carl Gauboy who are uh, making their own artworks today that comment on uh, the history of this place and the history of native people in the area um, and uh, uh, Gauboy has, uh, has used the, the Eastman Johnson collection himself and even painted Eastman Johnson into the scene uh, in his uh, mural at the Superior Public Library. So uh, uh, I think that's made it part of part of a, a, a kind of a, uh, a full circle of art and uh, people looking across cultural lines and finding a lot of points of points in common. Why is he in your mural? Well, he is one of the, the great frontier artists, that, um, as they're called. And he came to Superior and painted scenes for which there is no other documentary evidence. Uh, views of Superior, uh, the way people dressed, the different kinds of activities that were going on in the harbor. He and he alone did them. So for this, it was a natural that we use his source material. When did you first discover Eastman Johnson? When I was in high school. And I saw his work reproduced in a Minnesota history text, and I just flipped out. I thought, this is great. Because like many Indian painters, I think I was obsessed with the idea of the long fringed buckskin dresses and the men wearing breech clouts. And so whenever I did the past, this is how I would always show Indians. And then I realized, and I was quite surprised that there was a historic progression of different kinds of outfits that Indian people would wear from the very earliest times through the fur trade period through the 20th century. And each style was very distinctive. They, there was a, uh, it was a fashion changes that happened in Indian society that's a kind of a hallmark of what era we're talking about. Um, the Eastman Johnson paintings uh, showed me the style of dress that was in that period of time. 150 years later, does your own work have kind of something in common with that of Eastman Johnson? Yes, I put some of Eastman Johnson's uh, work into every painting that I do. Uh, those paintings that I do of the fur trade era, of course. He, um, I, I think he also, um, I should mention that um, most Indian artists in Minnesota today do uh, visionary work or do emotional work or they do passionate work, but very few do historical work. Uh, elsewhere in the country, many Indian artists do uh, work based on historical research. They go into museums, they look at historical photographs, they look at historical paintings. Out of that, they combine to show their own historic images. Um, I, uh, I'm one of the few Indian artists in this part of the country to actually go after history. So Eastman Johnson is one of my sources. What do the faces and scenes depicted by Eastman Johnson tell us about the Ojibwe today? What I uh, can't get over is that many of the faces that he painted look just like Indian people today. You can pick out those faces and find them on any Indian community uh, here in the North. So that means that he was very authentic, that he had an eye for the type of face uh, we know that those people were our ancestors because we still look like that. Those faces are still there. So that's, uh, uh, that's quite marvelous, just to be able to have portraits of our ancestors. You, uh, that should excite anybody. Is the Eastman Johnson collection important to the Ojibwe people today? I think it is for the reasons I mentioned, uh, that these are ancestral portraits, and it's important because here was an artist who was uh, not only had an eye for the portrait, but had an eye for atmosphere. 
And so the landscapes that are behind the figures, I think, are just as important. You can uh, go to Grand Portage, for example, and you can find the exact spot where he stood to do that famous painting of Hat Point with the birch bark wigwams in the foreground. And when you can stand, stand there and actually see this beautiful color with these beautiful skies and the clouds and the sun and the, the blue lake, uh, it connects us to our past.